are happy to see you here, especially uh, given the threat of the impending, uh, impending bus strike that rattled our nerves quite a bit. Um, we have it uh, ended up ended, uh, just fine. Um, uh, so traditionally, we start with thanking our sponsors for the event. And just a reminder, as usual, after the end, at the end of the event, we migrate to Linux pub to continue our socializing. Everyone is welcome to join us. Uh, today, we decided to bring some novelty into our event. And <coughs> uh, today's event will be in the format of a research carnival. Six of our advanced students will be presenting um, their projects in, uh, during the five minutes. And after the five minute talk, uh, there, will, there will be another five minutes dedicated to answering your questions. Um, <clears throat> the order of students are on the board in case you want to remember the names. Um, our students are affiliated with three research groups, uh, Mineral Research, uh, Mineral Deposit Research Unit, uh, Volcanology and Petrology uh, Lab, uh, Diamond Exploration Lab. And without further ado, we start with Andy Wicker on his uh, project, his project on teal geochemistry of a concealed timberland, supervised by late Peter Witteburn uh, and co-supervised by Craig Hart. Um, just a short reminder, Maya will be the designated timekeeper and uh, she will give you uh, a sign at the fifth minute to request it. Alright, wonderful. Uh, yeah, so my name is Andrew and I'm a master's student with the MBRU. And um, so I guess I'll start things off talking about uh, some of the exploration research that we're doing at the MBRU. Um, and essentially uh, how we're using till geochemistry to detect concealed kimberlites in the Northwest Territory. So with this project, we're working on the Kelvin kimberlite, which if you're not familiar with, um, is uh, it sits in the southeast portion, southeast portion of Slate Geologic Province, or right down the, right down the street from Gatcho K. Um, it is a relatively, well, it is an inclined, pretty irregular pipe dominated by KBK infill with some uh, lesser HK and transitional phases in there as well. Um, now it is essentially fully hosted within metaturbidites here, shown in the green, uh, with some granitoids off towards the east and off towards the west as well right here. It subcrops from bedrock in a very small surface, surface expression, only around like 800 square meters down here at its southeasternmost point, which is essentially right underneath the lake. Now. At Kelvin, there's no Kim train that's been uh, that's associated with it, whether that's through the NTGS Kid database or through uh, industry exploration. Um, however, we know that essentially the dominant ice flow direction in this area from the Faraday Kim trains and some from the Gatcho K area is essentially due west, denoted essentially by that uh, that big blue number two arrow. That's that's the main source of our clastic dispersion in this, uh, the KFC is what they call it, the Kelvin Faraday Court. Um, now, so what we did is we went out here and we uh, took a bunch of soil samples. We were sampling V-horizon soils of a relatively uniform uh, till blanket, uh, analyzed those, or sorry, sieved those to minus 180 microns, and then analyzed those by 4-acid and aqua region ICPMS, trying to pick up any sort of signs of either classic dispersion or hydromorphic dispersion around the pipe as well essentially trying to see through that cover. Now, these uh, chromium and nickel sort of sum up the results from the four acid. Here's a bunch of other elements that show relatively similar. These are all nice pathfinder elements that you that you might find for for kimberlites in the slave, essentially contrasting the kimberlite relative to your country rocks here. So what we're seeing is uh, elevated concentrations sort of concentrated around this uh, southern half of the study area that vector right back towards our known subcrop location uh, underneath the lake there. And then there's actually some evidence of uh, possibly a northwest shift in ice flow off towards that way, but I'm not really going to talk about that. Um, with Aqua Regia data, we see relatively similar results as well. In fact, it's a little bit more cleaned up. There's less noise. Background values are, or up ice values are a bit lower, which is always nice to have. Then we have these elevated values sort of vectoring right back to our known subcrop location. The two different digestion methods do have their uh, their benefits. 
folic acid is gonna dissolve a lot of your resistant silicates and oxides that you might see from indicator minerals. Um, however, agar regia does uh, decrease the noise, but if you're looking at really subtle responses, which we are here because there's no chemtrain, so we know there's not a lot of physical material entering into the, into the till. A lot of uh, key elements, niobium, tantalum, and titanium are too low. They fall below practical detection limits, which uh, in this case is sort of a strike against aqua regia. So in this case, we, we're, we're, we're thinking four acid is a little bit better, but obviously they do both work here. Um, now what we did was we took two of those anomalous samples, two of those background samples, sieved them down into progressive size fractions, essentially everything below minus 180, down as fine, fine as we can get it, and analyze that by four acid, essentially trying to see what size fraction shows the best contrast between anomalous and background. And what we're seeing, first of all, is in this sort of 150 to 106 micron fraction, we're seeing a really good contrast between anomalous and background samples. And we're attributing that to essentially kimberlite indicator mineral fragments. So they're too fine that they weren't picked out during traditional kim picking. Um, but we are getting some, some really decent separation here in those size fractions. Now, that is essentially saying you could target those size fractions if you really wanted to. You can, you can sieve it twice, uh, whatever these soil samples are or till samples. <coughs> However, if you just want to sieve it once, or you want to compare the minus 180 micron fraction to the minus, say, 63 micron fraction, which is uh, suggested by the GSC for most of their till sampling, or like minus 25, you can calculate the subfractions as well. And so we did that here, and, and essentially what we're seeing, this anomalous to background response ratio, we're actually seeing it decrease in the finer fractions, which is a bit like contradictory to what uh, literature may suggest. Um, and, you know, these are just four samples. We're not saying it's definitive. Um, oh, no. Right. Sorry. Um, not, not saying it's definitive. Hopefully, we'll be able to analyze some other samples uh, from, like, the DO18 Kimberlite from Eric and Kyder's project um, and maybe sort of pin down why this is the case. But uh, for now, we're actually seeing the minus 180 micron fraction is a bit better than, like, say, the minus 63 micron fraction. That's it, I'll leave it at that, so. So when I say that, it means you have one minute to finish, right? Okay? So you can go to conclusions. Uh, the end. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Questions? Questions? So do you have a contour problem here, or not a contour problem, is, is there any elevation difference between the, the where the samples are taken here, like in the Faraday there's some, some elevation difference? Yeah, the across the study area there's around 30 meters, so there's not much. Um, for instance, let's see, like, and the, the lake is only around 10 meters deep as well, so we're not looking at a huge elevation contrast where that might come into play is, uh, late stage deglaciation flows that may be deflected around topography. So that's possibly what's causing this sort of late northwest ice flow and some of those elevated values right there as well. What's the scale? What's the scale on this? Uh, oh, sorry, this is half a kilometer right here. So we're sampling, sampling relatively close. So, you know, we only sampled around a kilometer and a half from the known subject application. Yeah. So you said uh, traditional Kimberlite indicator sampling of the, the till didn't, didn't respond. Yeah. That way. And but the but the Kimberlite does have good indicator content. Uh, from everything that I've read, it's relatively low content okay. of all of these indicators. So you guys didn't pick any indicators from your samples. No, we didn't. We were just meterizing soil sampling. Yeah. Okay. How thick is the till? It's uh, less than five meters on average, oh, okay. yeah. There's actually no bed, bedrock exposure in this area as well, so it's a relatively uniform till blanket, but mm -hmm. yeah, relatively thin. Right. Yeah. 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 Thank you. So our next uh, speaker is Bianca Phillips from MDRU, uh, talking on talking on direct discovery of concealed kimberlites through microbial community fingerprinting, also co-supervised by Tito Winterburn and Craig Park. Okay, 
Okay, so one of the, the points of our research group is to is to develop uh, through cover exploration techniques. So I'm just going to take you through um, what we've been doing in applying microbiology um, for the through cover exploration of kimberlites. Uh, so what we actually do is we characterize the soil microbial community by sequencing their DNA and looking at relative abundance changes in different species that occur over top of different um, subsurface geological features. And so the unique thing about this is that microbes are actually very, very sensitive to changes in the soil environment. Um, and so we can, we can detect uh, subtle geochemical changes that might not be detected by traditional geochemical or geophysical constraints or methods um, that have innate um, constraints on their analytical detection limits. Um, as well, the cost to sequence uh, DNA has dropped drastically over the last 20 years. Um, so this is now something that is cheap and efficient that we can apply in mineral exploration. So the first kimberlite that we evaluated for this type of exploration is the DO18 kimberlite. If some of you are familiar with Erica Kyer's work over the last couple of years, also with Peter Winterburn, it's the same, uh, same deposit. And so we have a relatively um, carrot-shaped uh, kimberlite here. Uh, the till in the region is about 20 meters thick. We also have a slope break across the center of the pipe. And so what we do is we look at the entire soil microbial community and we assign statistical groups in order to differentiate which species are driving um, changes that we might be able to use to detect buried kimberlites. So in this case, this figure that you're looking at is actually a sum of different indicator species that we've determined um, statistically that are driving these changes. So that's positive indicators and negative indicators. So those are the positive indicators of those species that are enriched above the deposit, and the negative indicators of those species that are depleted above the deposit. So we can use this normalized sum in order, in order to detect the, the DO18 kimberlite in this case. And as you can see, we have a pretty distinct anomaly um, directly on top of, of this kimberlite. You can also look at the overall microbial diversity of the soils. Um, and as they change on top of the kimberlite relative to the background material. So on the left-hand figure here, you can actually look at, so we have species on the y-axis and number of reads on the x. And as you can see, so the, the, blue, the blue lines here are actually the background material, and the red lines are the samples that were taken above the kimberlite. And just from this graphical representation, you can see that we have almost a 50% reduction in overall species above the kimberlite relative to the background material. And you can also map that um, just as we have with the indicator species to see a nice anomaly directly on top of the DO18 kimberlite. So the next thing we did was to assess Andes kimberlite, Kelvin. Uh, so this is a little bit different. We have a very irregular shape. Uh, again, like Andy said, the till in the region is less than five meters on average, um, but the, the northernmost part of the pipe is actually buried within um, up to 150 meters of bedrock. And so the first thing we tried to do was look at microbial diversity. Uh, we didn't have to do any statistics for this. And we see, again, the same type of anomaly that we had at DO18 present at Kelvin in that northernmost section of the pipe. And then to look at the indicator species, we decided to go at this kimberlite blind. So instead of doing any sort of statistics, we looked at the DO18 indicators that we had to see if we had the same um, types of species present <coughs> at the Kelvin kimberlite, and we do. And so this, again, is a sum of the indicator species, both positive and negative, so enriched and depleted that we have at Kelvin that are also present at DO18. And again, we see that anomaly focused right in the northernmost section of the pipe. So not only do we have direct target identification of kimberlite through 20 meters of till at DO18, but we also saw that through up to 150 meters of bedrock at Kelvin. Uh, in addition to that, we have reproducibility of the application between deposits. So we have conserved species that are present um, microbial communities change drastically depending on a lot of different um, soil variables, but the fact that you can actually find indicators that are shared for kimberlites um, is pretty astonishing. Um, where we're going now with it, we want to continue developing our kimberlite database. So the idea is that we have this fingerprint of what kinds of species we find at kimberlites, and we can use this as we get more data to explore further for different kimberlites in covered regions. Um, we also want to look at the anomaly formation mechanism. So we don't actually know what they're responding to just yet. Um, if you recall Andy's uh, geochemical maps, it's obviously not responding to these trace elements. We have them in very different locations. Um, we think it might have to do with kimberlite weathering and potentially gas migration through the bedrock and through the till. And we also would like to apply this to different styles of mineralization and also in different climate regions. So 
we've actually applied this to two porphyries in British Columbia and had um, similar success as we had with these kimberlites, um, but also assessing kimberlites in different environments, but also any types of mineralization where we might detect changes um, between the background material and whatever mineralization or kimberlitic material that we see. And just want to acknowledge the EGI uh, as well as Peter, who lost Peter this year. Um, this work wouldn't have been possible without him. Uh, as well as Prolabs, so the microbiologists we work with, Sean Crow and Rachel Sinister. Yeah. Why, why should the microbial diversity increase over kimberlite? It decreases over the kimberlite, actually, yeah. Um, so it could be a number of things. It could be a toxicity effect. So there could be some chemical component present um, that just reduces the number of, of species that are happy in that environment, but it could also be adaptive. So if there's something there that certain species are well equipped to deal with, um, they might thrive and outcompete the other species. How difficult are the analysis? Is um, it commercially available? Well, we are doing it. <laughs> um, obviously we're doing this in a research capacity, but um, in preliminary stages, we can apply this in a commercial setting. Um, it's pretty easy. We, we do the same type of sampling, like Andy and I were sampling the same stuff together. We need less material. So I take around 100 and 200 grams, uh, and then we extract the, the DNA from the soils, which, depending on the manpower, um, can vary the time that it takes. And then you send it for sequencing, and we run it through our database, ideally. Do you have any idea what kinds of gases might be released from a kimberlite if it is? Yeah, related so to gases? we're thinking either hydrogen, methane, or carbon dioxide. Um, I don't have any data to show you right now, but I've actually done a couple of experiments um, on trying to assess what that what that might be. Um, but I don't have any results yet. Also, open to any insights on that. Um, obviously, we don't know what it is yet. Um, Any similar case studies? Has anybody else tried this somewhere, whether it's for kimberlite or other metals? No. Um, so there has been, I don't want to say similar, but there has been microbial application to exploration in like late 90s, um, early mid 2000s, um, but it's been restricted to just looking at one species and how it responds. Um, technology has also progressed so much. Um, that the types of sequencing that was done for those types of analyses is just really outdated now. So when it comes to this sort of next generation um, sequencing, no one's really been doing it for, for mineral or exploration yet. So, yeah. But we have assessed it for <coughs> Thank you, Bianca. Maybe it's time to invest into uh, microbiology. Microbio <laughs> Yeah. Uh, our third speaker is Dylan Cole from Diamond Exploration Lab and his project on geochemical modeling for kimberlite megacris. Hi everyone. Yep. Uh, my name is Dylan. I'm a second year master's student in the Diamond Exploration Lab. I'm going to walk you through kind of a brief introduction to my project, which is uh, determining the origin of megacris from the muskox kimberlite. So, megacris. Um, a lot of questions still about them, but in recent years, a lot of petrologists are shifting away from the original uh, fractional crystallization model that have been used to explain megacris formation towards more metasomatic um, origin by protokimberlitic fluids. But again, there are still a lot of questions that have yet to be answered. Uh, first and foremost, whether it's actually possible for a megacris suite to crystallize from the reaction between a protokimberlitic fluid and mantle wall rock and the relationship that megacris have to their host kimberlite isn't necessarily clear, whether it's strictly a genetic relationship or whether the two aren't coupled necessarily. Uh, the megacris website connection, so at the Jericho kimberlite uh, from a paper that Kofi Lovett et al. 2009, um, they noted a geochemical overlap between um, minerals from the megacris suite and the web website suite, and that was taken uh, to imply that websterites rep represent a kind of intermediate metasomatic product between unmetasomatized maple prototype and megacris. So that hasn't been looked at at any other kimberlite types, so we're doing that as well. 
Um, time scales of crystallization are these metasomatic processes that are taking place happening on the order of tens of thousands of years or perhaps take millions of years um, to form megachrys. And all of this is important because without the explanation of megachrys in a kimberlite, uh, kind of fails or hinders our complete understanding of kimberlite from melt generation in the mantle to emplacement at the surface. So, so far <coughs> I've analyzed my samples on the SEM looking for inclusions like like the strontonite inclusions in that diopside or you know, looking at the reaction rims of the host kimberlite looking for any zoning. Um, after that I got major element data from the microprobe um, and recently, I've been getting trace element and light isotope data from my client apyroxenes, and we've done both of those through in situ laser ablation ICPMS. It's a lot cheaper, faster, and easier than doing wet column chemistry. Um, and with all that data, um, I've been modeling uh, geochemical reactions of uh, fluid rock interactions in a piece of code called the Deep Earth Water Model. So, again, back to that Megachris web strike connection. Um, the first thing I did when I got all that geochemical data was I plotted my samples up against um, existing xenolith data um, from the Muscox Kimberlite by Newton et al. 2015. And I found essentially what was the same thing um, as Jericho was that my samples plot well within the Webstrike field. So we are seeing some genetic or some geochemical relationship there. Um, and again, what was applied to that relationship is that you're having this progressive metasomatism from prototype to webstrate to high chrome megachris. So that relationship is also seen there. Again, using um, lead isotopes, um, we see essentially the same relationship. So my megachris, which are these green points here, are plotting on top of the same samples that were analyzed um, in that Newton paper in 2015, which are these red points. So kimberletic megachris and um, Webstrite, clonopyrocines from Webstrites are plotting within the same field, which is actually plotting on top of the field for existing uh, light isotope data from the South African Kimberlites um, data from Smith et al. 1983, um, but do vary a little bit from the clonopyrocine megachris data from Davies et al. 2001. So, knowing that, knowing, seeing some kind of relationship and using all this geochemical data I have, I've been modeling fluid rock interactions in the Deep Earth Water Model, or DEW for short. And essentially what DEW is, it's a compilation of aqueous speciation data for bicarbonate, carbonate, sulfate, and silica species in conjunction with experimental solubility and equation of state data that allows for modeling of fluid and rock reactions at 1200C and 6 GPA, so appropriate for modeling um, met mantle metasomatic processes. So how we're using this in my project is we're taking the composition of a primary kimberlite fluid from Stan and Schmidt 2017. We're reacting that with data uh, with a hypothetical rock based on the compositions of real muscox prototypes and imported from the literature. Um, we add volatile phases and carbonate as needed to see how that influences um, the products that are crystallized from that reaction. And we're also using some compositions based on experimental data from Kessel et al. 2005 and 2015, which are in the stenospheric fluid, essentially in equilibrium with the stenospheric mantle, and an eclogitic fluid, which would be equilibrated with an eclogite. So really quickly, this is how the data comes back. So this is the molar, molar component of pyrogarnet as a, of the, num the number of moles reactant consumed, which is essentially that prototype. And this kimberlitic fluid, as the reaction progresses, moves right just below the composition of actual um, measured pyro component in Muscox megachris, whereas the eclogitic and the stenospheric fluid models wind up in compositions that are far too magnesium to be representative of um, megachris from Muscox. You go back to the last slide. So, preliminary conclusions, uh, Muscox and Chris show the same geochemical overlap with Webstrites that was observed at Jericho, which suggests that there's some, some kind of relationship between the two. Um, most likely that Webstrites are the kind of intermediate product between the prototype and Megachris. 
blood isotope data shows the same thing, that Websterites and clinopyroxene megacris are plotting right on top of the existing data for not only with each other, but with existing blood isotope data from the whole rock Kimberley. And we're going to get some whole rock isotope data from both the Muscox and the Jericho Kimberley. So there's kind of a one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one correspondence there to make sure we're seeing the same thing. And preliminary modeling shows that the kimberlytic fluid reacting with lithospheric mantle produces the typical megacris sweep with compositions comparable to muscox. Uh, both the asthenospheric and the equigenetic compositions fail. And we're going to continue modeling with that and might extend to some modeling of P-mounts with an existing carbonate model or a, a new carbonate model that we'll have access to very soon. That's it. Questions? Uh, 
notably that uh, only type 1 exegites are diamond upper oath. This is a good example. Um, however, uh, Guru and his colleagues um, described only on the initial um, and uh, the final result of our crystallization. Um, now, we, uh, at the first time, we have uh, more clear and more reliable uh, data about uh, this uh, process and mental. Uh, at uh, this screen, you can see a part of uh, almond and gristler uh, diagram. The green field uh, corresponds uh, with uh, uh, fresh or um, part of uh, garments from a low mechanism eclogites. Um, I used only one sample as an initial, uh, as an initial point. Um, the dark, uh, uh, the dark green uh, points uh, reflect altered, um, altered green uh, from uh, low mechanism eclogites. After that, you can see um, violet, violet spots uh, correspond uh, to protocols from uh, the high mechanism eclogites. And uh, finally, you can see a uh, red uh, area and a red spot uh, reflect um, completely or crystallized uh, um, high mechanism current. Yeah. Oh, the same picture uh, you can see uh, in relation with uh, uh, rarers and trace elements, uh, which um, increase from uh, fresh, unaltered um, uh, core parts of uh, load magnesium metallogites over the protocols and uh, other greens, and up to uh, completely crystallized high magnesium granite. Uh, the whole picture uh, is as follows. Um, at the first stage, stage of alteration, um, uh, magnesium rich uh, rings uh, are formed uh, around uh, completely fresh uh, low magnesium. <coughs> um, the second stage is uh, partly a retrospective high magnesium of the jet, and uh, you can see protocols which can be preserved in uh, uh, single uh, large trains. And eventually, uh, you can see computer with its desired uh, hemodism projects. So, and um, uh, summing up uh, all the data, uh, the following uh, conclusions can be drawn. <coughs> Uh, the catacolipologites provide the first photographic uh, evidence of the metasomatic nature of the high mechanism amantal pagites. This is that uh, high mechanism pagites can be um, spread uh, wider in mantle than previously recognized. And uh, mantle uh, metasomatizing uh, fluid control the origin of the uh, high mechanism pagites. And eventually, uh, diamonds, diamonds could be associated with their crystallized high magnesium projects. So, this way. Your um, rare earth element plots, back to those, I don't know if you can, but uh, like on the left side of the plot, there's the uh, herbariums and the large island. And with the files which uh, mobile and mens somatic fairly easily. On the right side of the plot, it looks like, but I wasn't quite sure, but there's more, there's a couple elements that are, that are elevated in these mens somatized eclogites that are, that are not mobile. They look like maybe niobium, I'm not sure. You'd have to go back to the plot there. A couple of the, uh, uh, keep going. Uh, maybe go back a couple more. This one? No, no, farther back. Where you had on one plot, you had both. Okay. That, the one on the bottom right? Yeah. Yeah, uh, WR type 1. So on the left, you can see barium, rubidium, that's going to move around fairly well in, in fluids. Um, on the right, uh, it looks like niobium, 
and tantalum. There's quite a difference. You, you know, it, that plot shows very well the differences, what, what elements are changing with gonosomatism. I just wonder if you had any thoughts on, on why there was the difference of these elements like uh, tantalum and niobium between the two, uh, metasomatized and non-metasomatized uh, anthrogenes. Oh, actually, in those elements, I'm just, it may be a, I'm not sure I'm on the right track here at all, if it makes any sense, but. Um, I think we can track uh, the same, uh, um, the same fingerprints, fingerprints in uh, the data graph, uh, mental ecologies. Um There are reasons that high-magnesium ecologies um, uh, comprise high-neobium uh, uh, proteins, yeah, and that. Uh, and uh, this is a clearer evidence of um, neobium and shizantelum also enrichment in this rows. The inflow of high distinct elements, uh, niobium and tantalum included, is a uh, very common for man to metasomatism. And we're still debating whether that's the sign of the carbonatite rich nature of that metasomatism or not. Yeah, but it's very common to have that secondary enrichment and luteal would be your indicator of that metasomatic enrichment. Thank you. Okay. The fifth speaker is David Sassi from uh, Volcanology and Ecology Lab talking on insights into timber light ascent dynamics from analog official experiments, supervised by Kevin Russell. Thanks, Sophia. Can you get right into this? So on the right here. I have a collection of images of coherent kimberlite from various different localities across the globe. And the first thing you'll notice in these images is that the mantle material inside the magma is rounded to some extent. And the reason why this is so interesting is because in the mantle, the xenoliths and the xenocris begin as these angular fragments. Right here. So this means that something must be happening during the ascent process for us to be going from this to that. And I think this can be largely explained by the process of attrition. So if I have my initial uh, size distribution of parent particles, which are very angular, and they collide at high velocities, they'll undergo fragmentation and break into smaller pieces. However, if the uh, collision is less energetic, <coughs> they'll undergo abrasion, releasing these surface chips and becoming rounder in the process. Um, so just some basic terminology. In attrition, we call these attrition products, the daughter products, and we call these initial particles the parent particles. So I study this process by doing analog experiments on a variety of mantle minerals. And uh, yeah, so this is iron pyroxene, for example. And in order to be able to say something about my experiments for the natural system, I scale them in terms of the flow dynamics. So, for example, I'll approximate a Reynolds number range for kimberlite dye descent, and I'll make sure that these experiments fall within that range. So after an experiment is done for a given mineral at a given experimental duration, I'll collect all of the experimental products and get a total grain size distribution. Below a certain size interval, uh, we get these daughter products. So in order to assess the extent of attrition, I'll get a ratio of the daughter products to the ratio of uh, the mass of all particles I've collected. And then I'll plot that throughout time for all minerals. I did uh, olivine in green, orthoparoxene in yellow, blue is clinoparoxene, red is garnet, and gray is diamond. And what you'll notice between all these different minerals is that we initially get a high rate of attrition, so a steep increase in the production of these broader particles, followed by a plateauing value, a plateauing rate. And that's because after a while, these particles lose their edge asperities and become <coughs> rounded, and there's also not enough energy left in the system for these particles to undergo fragmentation. So to further quantify these trends, I fitted a model, I fitted model curves to each mineral series, uh, which can be described by this equation down here. 
which relates the attrition uh, ratio metric to an A value, which is the plateauing value of the mineral trend, and a B value, which is the attrition rate. And because the physical properties of all the mantle minerals are different, they're going to have different A and B values. So I mentioned that the experiments I've done are scaled to the natural uh, die percent system. So now I want to start thinking about what that previous figure means in terms of timber-like descent. So this is that same figure I showed in the previous slide, but I've rotated it 90 degrees, and I've converted the x-axis to distance, so distance traveled from time, by multiplying by an approximate descent velocity of four meters per second, which is quite reasonable. So now we can think, uh, if a kimberlite magma is sourcing mantle material at a depth, depth of, say, 200 kilometers, what might happen uh, during the ascent to all the different minerals. So we look at olivine, for example, or any mineral that undergo high attrition rates in it initially, and then uh, those rates are going to plateau as the minerals become rounder towards what we're seeing at the surface. And in order to seek evidence of this actually happening in kimberlites, what I did is I extracted different uh, mineral xenocris from coherent kimberlite, specifically uh, the Divic A154N pipe, and I looked at them in terms of their morphologies and surface features, and then I compared them to my experimental products down here. So my experimental products have morphologies and surface textures which I know are a, fu a function of this uh, attrition process. And in comparing the two, uh, they re reveal a mar remarkable resemblance, which is quite convincing that uh, attrition is indeed occurring in kimberlites. So both the experimental products and the natural crystals have nicely rounded morphologies and rough surfaces which are littered with these impact pits. Another really cool thing which came out of uh, my research was relating the uh, impact pit diameters to a collisional velocity which has been well studied in the engineering sciences. So in looking at uh, natural olivine and garnet xenocrysts, I measured a lot of impact pit diameters and I got a collisional velocity out of that uh, for olivine and garnet both around four to five meters per second. So that's really cool because we can use that collisional velocity to say something about the die descent process, the die descent uh, velocities and rates. And uh, it's also a really unique tool in, the, in volcanology and geological sciences to relate uh, impact pits to magma flow rates or magma ascent rates. So I'll leave it there. Thank you. I would have guessed that, especially for all of the, a lot of the small scale features in the surface of each grain would be obliterated by yeah. serpentinization. Yeah, so what's important is that the, all the features I'm observing on these grains, they occur during the late stages of ascent. So all these small scale features, they might be overprinted by whatever's happening later on in the process. So all the impact pits I'm observing, they happened in the last stages of ascent. Whereas if uh, we have lower velocities or if we have um, dissolution features occurring uh, at the start of the scent, those textures are going to be overprinted by these pits. How do you separate these mineral grains from the coherent kimberlite without destroying any of the superficial yeah. features? It's really tough and it involves, it, it has a really low success rate. So what I do is, in my uh, coherent drill core, I drill around the grain, and then I carefully uh, extract the, um, the coherent ground mass from the grain just by uh, breaking it up. And then if I observe that material is falling off from the grain, then obviously that's invalid. But there'll be cases where it, it comes off really nicely. Did you consider using a self-rag or EPDE system? Uh, so they have, yeah, they do have cell frag at U of A, and one of our new students is going to be doing a lot of work with cell frag. Uh, I mean, yeah, if I had known about cell frag, it would have made my life a lot easier, but uh, yeah, I guess uh, life is easy for the new students then.
um, altered it nice, again, dry and fluid saturated. Uh, again, CPX is the predominant phase in the higher medium temperature regime. And in the, <coughs> in the uh, lower and uh, temperature regime, we can see a lot of bectolite, which is the mineral we, we've been after. It has been difficult, but we've been able to get the thermal val thermodynamic values for that uh, mineral, uh, put it in, into the, our database, and it is perfectly predicted by our model. And the last, uh, in the fluid saturated environment, again, a lot of complications in the low temperature field uh, with uh, a lot of um, uh, carbonates uh, and amphibolites developing. Um, in the dry, in the dry uh, environment, we can see the um, characteristic garnet, ectolite, uh, fluorostenite, what we see in our altered night. So our models, the equilibrium models, do predict minerals that we see in our sample. Uh, so in conclusion, we can say that uh, the subsolidus reactions are confirmed by these equilibrium models in terms of most of the minerals produced in the um, subsolidus uh, area, and most of the reactions occur in the mid temperature zone to, towards the low temperature uh, zone. As well, another conclusion uh, is that uh, fluid saturation, um, based on the fluid saturation model, we see the minerals which are not uh, which are not found in our samples. So, fluid, uh, our, uh, the fluid. So the subsolidus reactions in the fluid limited environment are the most uh, are the explanation for the metamorphic reactions. Thank you. If you have any questions. How did you decide on the composition of the fluid? Yes, it's uh, it's uh, purely uh, hypothetical. It's up to me. I can vary fluid. Are your samples away from the kimberlite, or are these right inside the kimberlite? These ones are uh, took from the kimberlite, like the samples that I have in our lab. Right inside, yeah. 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 So on this note, we finish our event. Thank you very much for your attendance.